welcome Citizens Climate University, a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobbies that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities on topics related to climate change and effective climate advocacy. And tonight we're essentially focusing on a couple of main goals. We're gonna to join together directly with some state representatives and state senators, as well as other CCL leaders to learn how they've continued to build on their engagement and keep climate change and CCL in their campaign's awareness. If you'd like to follow along tonight's slide deck, I'll put that in the chat window as well here so you can see the uh, information as it comes along and you don't have to take too ambitious of a notes but it's just cclusa.org forward slash candidates CCU, kind of easy to remember. And before I pass the baton off, let me introduce our lineup for speakers tonight. The first half is gonna feature three wonderful group leaders of CCLs and their uh, events that they've been hosting throughout the country. Ed Bayshore is CCL Tucson Oro Valley's group co-leader and a retired astronomer for the University of Arizona. He was the deputy principal investigator of the Cyrus Rex asteroid sample return mission. So if you have any uh, celestial questions after tonight's webinar, I'm sure he'd love to speak to those. I am very fascinated by that topic as well, Ed, so thanks for being on the line. And with him in Tucson is Jane Conlin. Jane is also the co-lead for the CCL Tucson Oro Valley Group and is a former ski shop owner and Telluride is involved in conservation and her family brought her to relocate to Tucson where she's taught high school English. Thank you for being here, Jane. And in addition to Ed and Jane, we have the wonderful Dennis Arp, who's a group leader in the North Orange County, Southeast LA County area of California. Dennis has been active with CCL for over five years, and his group was the first to host CCL's Southern California Regional Conference back in the day too. So this first half is gonna feature all of them, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. The second half of tonight's webinar after Q&A and presentation is gonna feature Representative Katrina Shanklin. Representative Shanklin was elected in 2012 to the Wisconsin State Assembly for the 71st District, and her background is in community organizing and renewable energy projects. Senator Hoag is the Iowa State Senator from the 19th District, and since 2007, he has also served in the Iowa House of Representatives beforehand, and the Iowa Senate Minority Leadership last year has also been a powerful author writing America's Climate Century, which provides a fundamental context necessary to understand climate change and calls on all of us as Americans to fight as well as the advice of the Honorable Claudine Schneider, a former U.S. Congresswoman from Rhode Island, who was the first and only woman to be elected to higher congressional office from the state of Rhode Island, and amongst many roles now is currently serving on Citizen Climate Education's board. So we're grateful to have all of their advice be featured in the second half on leveraging relationships with state level officials to build those essential connections, which also happens to be our action for national groups this month. So just a quick window in, tonight's learning goals are really the following, they're threefold. Hopefully after attending tonight's webinar, you should be able to prepare your own group's plans to deepen relationships with your district and the congressional candidates therein. Hopefully you'll also be able to strategically highlight the importance of climate change solutions and actions in your interactions. And then lastly, we also hope that you can understand a bit more about how to implement suggestions from these state leaders featured tonight on how to best leverage local officials' connections for your relationship building. So without further ado, let's look at the agenda. It's gonna be pretty straightforward. The first half is gonna talk about coffee with candidates from our Tucson group, as well as an actual climate campaign forum from California 39th District. And then we'll have a chance to do Q&A with both of those groups on relationship building for the first half of the hour. And then Senator Hoag and Representative Schneider will have some advice and then Representative Schenkel will pass on hers and we'll have a Q&A to end the discussion tonight with state officials. So I'll get out of the way now and at this point pass the baton to you, Ed and Jane. And again, thank you all for making it on tonight's webinar. Feel free to ask questions as we go along and we're looking forward to jumping right in. Thank you, everyone. Well, thanks a lot, Brett. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to everybody and tell, uh, tell them a little bit about what we have done in Tucson. Uh, Jane and I were, uh, we had uh, uh, worked on a, uh, an effort to try to increase the membership in our, uh, our chapter and we were reasonably successful with that and uh, the, the next thing that naturally follows is uh, what are we going to do with these folks and for those of you who've been working with volunteers for a while, 
uh, you know, volunteers want to do, you know, want to work, but you, uh, you want to do what they want to do. You want to find something that's really going to get them engaged. So uh, Jane and I presented them with a, um, a list of possible projects that we could get on and that we could do later in the year. And one of them was an idea that Jane had come up with called Coffee with Candidates. And the whole idea there was uh, to um, uh, put together a program of talking with our candidates. And it just, uh, we had overwhelming support, uh, just lots of interest in that. And so we just decided, let's, let's do it. So we put together this slide deck uh, to show people at our uh, meeting where we were organizing it and starting to get ourselves put together, uh, but also so that they could take away a hard copy and use it as a set of notes. Uh, when they went home and started to uh, make appointments and uh, schedule their meetings with, uh, with their candidates. So our objectives were really to educate candidates about uh, the candidates that were running for local office. So we're talking about congressional districts, gubernatorial candidates, uh, local legislative candidates. And in Arizona, our Arizona uh, Corporation Commission, sometimes called Public Utilities Commissions. Uh, so we wanted to educate them about CCL and our signature policy, carbon fee and dividend. Uh, we also wanted to prepare our uh, members of our groups for more enlightened town hall discussions and future policy decisions. So we wanted to inform uh, our Arizona CCL members um, about what the candidates were up to with respect to climate. Uh, we also wanted to help uh, us and our membership better understand the candidates position on climate change. That really goes to this enlightened town hall discussion. Uh, perspective. We plan to share that information only with our Arizona CCL membership. We're about 1,700 statewide. We have about 400 people on the roster, not nearly that many active people, but uh, we have a fair number of people in the Tucson region who signed up. We kind of thought we'd use that as a way to get those people who maybe haven't come to a meeting engaged by saying, you know, we're active politically and trying to help understand what's going on with the candidates. Furthermore, uh, this helps us create good long-term relationships with candidates. Even for the candidates who don't win, those might be really good grass top endorsers later on. So the idea is, is that these are community leaders, whether they win or not. If they win, we've got a good face-to-face -face background with our candidates uh, after they have, uh, have won and we, they assume office. If they don't win, we can follow up and try to get some endorsements from them. And most importantly, in some deep sense, is to develop our skills as lobbyists to help our members know, better understand what we do as lobbyists, as advocates for carbon fee and dividend. It's a really low risk way to get people involved in lobbying, to find out if they like it, uh, to give them some practice, and to see what goes on in Washington when we go back there and lobby our congressional candidates. So we just felt like this whole approach was really a great way to uh, to familiarize everybody with, uh, with some of the most basic things that uh, CCL does. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Jane because uh, she really handles most of the logistics and working with uh, our group members on getting this done. So Jane. Hey Brad, thanks for having us. Um, on making appointments, most of our volunteers had never done any lobbying. They'd had no experience. And so they needed some really uh, practical information. Their anxiety level was a little bit high. And so um, any uh, concrete information you could give with them, share with them uh, was helpful. I'm not going to read through the slides, but I will point out a couple of things that we have found that's important to emphasize. Planning the meeting. Um, it's important to plan together um, as opposed to the more experienced person just doing it on his or her own. And um, both of the people, we've just paired up. Um, I put two people to a meeting and we started out with about two dozen, but you know how summers go and people get sick. So we're down to about 15 people. Um, but we wanted the, each pair uh, to do both to research and be familiar with the candidates. And I had matched them up. I was trying to get uh, them into areas um, where they didn't know the candidate beforehand. And so it was a new relationship. Before the meeting, um, of course, uh, it goes to say, be early. And if you're going to meet in a coffee house, not a, an office, 
then uh, be a little bit early. Go in and don't wait outside. Go in and get a good table in a place that's not in the middle of a high traffic area and maybe get some brownies and cut them up into little bite-sized pieces. Um, be sure to review your goals. Just a couple of things you both want to remember. And then we use our <laughs> the postcard they have to take. We just insist that they take it. They put it on the table uh, for the staffer and the candidate and they can use it then as a, um, a little one, two, three uh, agenda. And also the staffers, uh, they can take it home with them. And, and these cards usually don't get thrown away very quickly. Um, in addition to the Climate Solutions Caucus most recent picture, um, I added the next month, I added from the uh, Yale Climate Project, the graphs that are really nice. Um, the American Support Action on Climate, not to leave, but at least to show it's a good visual aid. This is just pure CCL. There is nothing here um, that would be unusual except down on bullet five. Make sure that um, your interviewers ask the candidates their views on climate change be really direct because it's important to start with what they know. So um, that's the only thing unusual about this. Essential questions. So we wrote these questions out and we are asking all of our teams to ask um, and write the answers to these specific essential questions. Uh, they're pretty obvious on the first one. Arizona is one of the states that we expect, that scientists expect to um, suffer uh, more extreme effects from climate change. And so uh, we want to make sure that um, we talk about that. And then down on, do you plan to discuss climate change and solutions in your campaign? This is really important. And in our discussions, our meetings, We've been pleasantly surprised that um, we have been able to um, make suggestions, for instance, um, that their discussion about climate change may include a, their website. It can include, it's not just debates and town halls, but speeches that they make. And so um, if you've done your research, you know that they say on their website they're concerned about the environment, then you can ask if they might go a little farther and mention climate change or solutions. So the only way you know that um, we find out is by asking those questions. Uh, here we have a little bit of Danny Richter. It's kind of a, um, a brief aversion but I wanted an easy way to keep track of our messaging over time. And so we're hopeful that as each, as the uh, volunteers develop relationships with the candidates, uh, especially the ones who win, that we can, we'll have uh, more meetings with them and that we can keep track of how we're doing, moving them up the scale. On the right is our uh, meeting plan chart. Um, it's just an organizational uh, start so that we're doing this CCL protocol and then I've added on here the questions that we we want them to ask. Things to capture in your notes. Of course, um, I didn't leave much room for a whole lot of verbiage, just there. Um, the, the, most basic part of their views. Uh, but down here, would you see recommendations is bullet point number four. Recommendations the staffer had about our policy and strategy. We're asking the candidate to come, they meet with us, and they, um, they give us their time. 
we're creating, we're going to some trouble to create a really congenial atmosphere and to start a nice working relationship. And one of the best ways to do it is to ask them their opinions. And um, so they have had a lot of experience by now. And so they will uh, be able to give us and they'll be happy to share their ideas about our policy and our strategy. And it kind of gives them a chance to uh, formulate ideas about what we're doing. Maybe it'll be easier for them to speak about it uh, when they're on the campaign trail or in a high pressure situation such as a town hall or a debate. No taking tips. We don't want to know what we, I, there, there's no room for anything except what the candidate uh, answers are. And Brett, would you like to speak about the grassroots engagement tracker? Okay, so that last link there is what I just put in the chat window as well. Now, along with us, we have a lot of resources uh, that we've been putting here, including the handout that Jane and Ed have shown, as well as that quarter sheet flyer. And then this is actually the database where if you are taking these robust notes as they're showing, uh, we actually wanna track those and they're in the grassroots engagement tracker link. So that way, if you're coordinating across chapters across the state, uh, these notes are gonna be shared and able to be you know, uh, essentially protected, but still also accessible to other groups as we put that information. In the slide deck, it's also there on that sheet and I'll pass it. Back to you, I guess, Ed, to wrap us up. Uh, you know, make sure that we do the uh, the CCL thing, which is always to send a thank you note uh, to get them uh, familiarized with uh, the fact that you know we're we're very cordial and we try to uh, engage everybody in a in a relationship uh, in a personal way. Uh, we've explained to them that uh, we do not endorse candidates, uh, and uh, we really wanted to push people to say that uh, you know you're going to have a good time on this, and we. You know, we did point it out, uh, you know, we're the good guys with the solution. And as Marshall Saunders says, uh, we're the cavalry. So, uh, you know, this is something that uh, we really try to, to impress on our group members to make sure that uh, they know that this is, this is very basic. Uh, this is very basic CCL, and this is a good way to get started with us. That we wanted to impress upon our volunteers that the work they're doing is really important that they may feel that it's just um, one step that's not going to go anywhere, but we know that's not true. That building a relationship, it takes time, and this is a first step, and we're really, really grateful to them for being part of that first step. Absolutely. Helping make that connection and realizing that stepping up means that at least one more conversation with important people is happening is critical. Well, thank you both for being here, and we'll field questions in just a little bit, but we'll pass it to you, Dennis, here to go over the candidate forum in California 39. Thank you, Brett. Um, yeah, so in, in California 39, um, we are in uh, predominantly in Orange County, and uh, traditionally it's been a Republican district, and our representative now is a, a longtime Republican who is the uh, was the, the first member of the Republican leadership to join the Climate Solutions Caucus. And we felt like we we're making good progress with him. And, um, and then he announced his retirement, which kind of threw things open in our uh, district. And we had 12 candidates, um, from independents, Republicans, Democrats, enter the race. And um, so we, we wanted to figure out a way to connect with them. And at the same time, kind of raise our own credibility in the district to elevate the the uh, the issue of climate change. And so, um, so as we attended some candidate forums that were scheduled in the district, the uh, climate change just didn't come up, even in the Democratic specific ones. And so, um, so we wanted, we, so we decided let's host our own. And so we uh, started figuring out how best to do that. And um, one. Our first step was to um, reach out to the candidates. Um, we had uh, a liaison from our group uh, was kind of designated for each of the 12 candidates. And we reached out to ask if, uh, to invite them. Um, we set up a date for it. We, did, we picked um, um, Earth Day and um, uh, decided we would host it at, we had a space that where we meet uh, at a church uh, that was big enough. They had a hall big enough to to hold about 120 people. And um, 
So we started reaching out to the candidates. It became really difficult with the Republicans. They, um, it's a very contentious uh, race now in the district. Um, it's one that's been targeted by uh, Democratic groups because, um, although the, because it's w one of them that um, Hillary Clinton carried um, in the presidential race, but um, they reelected a Republican member of Congress. So it's really kind of a swing district now. And, and so they, uh, there's a lot of hostility coming to the Republican candidates in the district. So they, they lay really low and it's really hard to even find out how to get in touch with their representative. Um, so it took some digging, and um, so we uh, we reached out to all of them, and um, we had we ended up getting six commit to attend. Uh, one of them, one of the Republicans, uh, four Democrats, and an Independent, and um, and so one of the ways that we wanted to kind of ensure um, our credibility as a nonpartisan group was we had one of our um, Group members attend uh, some some uh, candidate forum training with uh, League of Women Voters in our area, and um, and we ended up enlisting one of their um, longtime uh, moderators to to uh, to moderate our event, and that those turned out to be really good uh, good efforts, really good ways to ensure uh, that our, our nonpartisanship on that. She the, our moderator was terrific at. Um, ensuring that and, and her experience showed in, in her preparation and reaching out to the and talking to the candidates before the, the forum and in, uh, in ensuring that the audience understood that uh, you know there was there was no to be no partisanship in their responses and so forth and and um, and that went really well and um, and just in the in the in the outreach to the candidates we uh, we, we had, it was great to talk with them and give them a little uh, introduction to CCL. A couple of them um, knew of CCL and knew of the caucus. Um, we met with a couple who were more receptive on an individual basis, and a couple of the candidates took a deeper dive into, into carbon fee and dividend. But at the event itself, um, uh, we one of the key things we did was to um, was to have the the questions all come from uh, the audience. Uh, have them write them on three by five cards, which we collected and then curated. And uh, some of them, if they, you know, were related to um, a particular issue, we consolidated and and um, and uh, and all the questions had to con pertain in some way to energy, climate change, or the environment. So the energy part of it was a was kind of an entree for our Republican candidate. Um, he, you know, he expressed his his uh, disdain for regulations, environmental regulations, and talked about the need for energy independence and and so forth. But uh, 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 so it, you know, it gave him a, a way to to speak to the issue without um, necessarily embracing uh, all environmental action or or all action on climate. Um, all of the candidates, you know, there was a question and that. Uh, uh, the, all of the, the candidates did um, profess to know what the Climate Solutions Caucus was. All of them said we should uh, have stay in the Paris, we, we should commit to the Paris Accords. Um, we, you know, we sh there, there were some uh, area of agreement across ideology. And, um, and um, so we felt really good about, we were, the idea of not having an open mic a part of this turned out to be a really good decision because we did have some people who were fringe, um, you know, audience members. And uh, there was somebody who was, who was issue was chemtrails. And, you know, I mean, you, you, sometimes you see at these forums, people uh, hijack uh, by, you know, going into a long diatribe before they even get to their question. So, um, so it worked out well to have to curate the questions and, you um, uh, because we had six candidates on the stage and, and gave each one a chance to answer each question, we didn't get to as many questions as we would have liked uh, in 90 minutes. I think we got to five. And, uh, but there was time each of the candidates stayed afterwards and had a chance to interact with people in the audience. And, and um, it, was, it was really a great just to, even just to have all of the candidates um, you know, in, in their remarks Thanks CCL for hosting the event and, uh, and, and to, to have all of them talk about the, the Climate Solutions Caucus. And uh, you know, there, was, there were areas in which uh, 
we really felt as if we raised the level of the issue in the district and, uh, and cemented our, our credibility in the district. And, um, and it, it has led to some good follow-up afterwards. There were the, the Republican candidate who made it through to the general election uh, did not attend our, our, um, our forum, but uh, the a local Republican mayor who has endorsed action and is part of our endorsement efforts uh, has become a, a colleague of ours, a friend of ours. And uh, she said, you know, she should have been there and I'm gonna reach out to her. And so we did get an invitation to one of her meet and greets, which tends to, which only friends get to, you know, they're not open events because they're worried about having people uh, come with hostility and anger. So, so, you know, we were invited as a friend to that, got a chance to have some one-on-one -on -one time with her. She committed to joining the, the caucus on day one, she said. Uh, if she's elected, and uh, and we hope to to kind of follow up on that. And in fact, um, we're, we've reached out to the League of Women Voters, and uh, we're meeting with them, and and uh, we hope to co-host a um, uh, an event now that we're down to two candidates, and uh, and uh, their plans for debates and and uh, and F uh, forums, and uh, we hope to be able to co-host with them on those, and and. Uh, and again, have CCL be kind of out front and, and ensure that climate change does come up during the, these uh, forums and debates that will be part of the general election. So we feel like we really met our goals of uh, wanting to elevate the issue of climate change and make it more front and center in the campaign to, uh, to kind of um, extend our influence and our, our uh, reputation as a respectful nonpartisan group and uh, and then to um, to develop relationships, um, have them um, uh, know that we are we come with respect and gratitude where we can find it, and and meet with them and um, and be a little farther along now that we're into the general election season. Excellent, thank you so much, Dennis. So just to play the MC role here and keep us on a roll, since we do have a lot of content on the second half, which is hearing directly from state level officials. And being that it is <laughs> election season, unfortunately, uh, one of our main presenters tonight actually had an invitation to attend the Issues School for Citizens in Cedar Rapids. So we did an interview, Senator Hogan and I, uh, which is still an exclusive uh, interview with advice that we provided our CCL network today. So I'm going to review that really quick. So we all know just overall that local and state level officials are really those that are significant influencers and they're one of our actions this month because one, they're in contact with members of Congress and candidates, especially during the election season. Two, they know climate impacts are at risk and are a constituent concern for their jurisdictions. And three, they're available to meet with you because you elected them. So that's why really tonight we're also focused on honing in on this advice from them on how to leverage their position to influence our members of Congress. So let's jump right in. And, uh, you know, Senator Hogue's uh, been active and uh, just a wonderful climate champion for decades within Iowa. He's got a lot of great advice on a nonpartisan level. And I'll just jump into a couple of slides, then we'll pass it to Representative Shanklin. But the number one thing that he said uh, that citizens need to know, if you don't speak up, you're not gonna make a difference. If you don't do anything, you could be pretty certain you won't make a difference, so keep speaking up, he said. Your involvement matters and each CCL chapter should have a goal to get more citizens more informed and more involved. And since it's an election year, he says, my advice includes speaking up with elected officials, including those already in office, as well as candidates seeking office. And this is especially true where there's an open seat. One of his recommendations for the best way to phrase it is our goal is to get a climate action majority. And if you have an elected official who you believe is a lost cause, he reminds, remember that a doubting Thomas today can be a leader for climate action tomorrow. Elected officials change their minds on issues because of polling, new facts, understandings, and because of new relationships. He's seen it happen, and even if a skeptical elected official or candidate isn't going to become a climate action leader immediately, you might be able to convince them to stop saying stupid things about climate change, he writes. Uh, additionally, what are some of the best ways to raise the climate issue without further polarizing candidates? This is a question that came earlier on. So he responds to this saying, when talking with candidates and officials in an election year, keep in mind, you're not trying to shame them or pin them down or apply a purity test. As a candidate, what people tell me becomes part of a mosaic of what people in my district want. 
So just tell candidates that climate action should be a priority. It's important, it's urgent, and we have solutions that work. People often try to pin candidates down at forums or events, he says, or shame them for past actions and his experience that hasn't been as effective. A better approach, he says, is to share your concern and invite the candidate into solving problems with you. What we really want is action and results, not necessarily just purity. So if you have a supportive elected official of any level, it's really good to ask their advice. Most elected officials like to give advice. I know I do, he says. It's even sometimes the best way to get a candidate or elected official to be more active on an issue because they take ownership of that advice and want to follow it through to make it work. So here's an example he writes from a recent pre-primary candidate forum. A citizen spoke at length about the dangers of methane levels and had to be reminded at the very end of five minutes to even ask a question. Each candidate then answered by sharing her or his already owned established positions on climate change without really even fully addressing that constituent's concerns. So a better question, in his opinion, is one that's framed like the following. And that is this. Thank you for taking my question. I'm very concerned about climate change and I think it's one of the most urgent issues facing our world today. I support carbon fee and dividend as a policy of solution and want to ask, what advice do you have for me as a citizen for making a difference in influencing policy that will address that? I think that's a well-phrased question straight from a state senator. So thank you very much, Senator Hogue, for that advice. So two last slides he kind of provides some insights on. Public edu education for him is very important. And to remind us all that you can communicate with candidates indirectly through publicly educating them. Keeping in mind that people uh, might not have the same level of knowledge or concern that you do about climate change is important. And so remind them why action makes a difference and make it tangible for people today in the United States. Highlight climate impacts, the danger for the future, the jobs that are being created in solutions industries, make all of that as tangible as possible, he says. Regarding meeting with candidates, as a candidate with less than four months to election day, what he writes is, what I don't need now, you know, coffee with candidates is great if you're early in the year, but now an hour with lots of different people here and there or groups is hard to manage. So right now, what I need is to reach out to talk to voters, especially voters who might not vote or voters who don't normally pay a lot of attention. However, if I'm already having an event, I want people to show up. And there are fundraising events and there's non-fundraising events, and it's wonderful when people show up to both and get to know the candidates. His advice, especially if you've never been to a fundraising event for parties on either side, is that it's okay to go, especially to ones that are publicly advertised, even if you can't contribute or can't contribute very much. It's possible that some candidates might be offended, so judge the situation, he says, but I don't like to exclude people, so for me it's okay. And if a suggested contribution, for example, is $100, you can still show up and contribute 20 and feel generally free to attend because it's a great way to get to know candidates and their staff to build those critical relationships. He also says, I know CCL does not advocate for a specific party or candidates, but it's smart for individuals that are concerned about climate change to get involved and be strategic as individuals acting as citizens are on their own free time or as part of one of the climate oriented groups that does take direct campaign action. For example, he writes, in an election is, uh, if an election is between two people, both of whom have given support for climate action, it's really important that citizens concerned about climate change show up to support both sides. Don't be phony about it. Don't pretend to be something you're not, but try to cover all the candidates if your group can make it work. When individuals have decided who they should support, you'd be surprised at how meaningful it is for candidates when citizens volunteer on whatever level. Regarding the frequency of asking state officials to engage reaching out to members of Congress, he says, I'm an elected official from one party and I'm already communicating my views to my representatives and senators who are of the opposite party. There's nothing wrong with me to continue to do this, but inviting new people is what's essential so that they hear from growing numbers of people and citizens in their district about the urgency of climate action. It's July in an election year. You don't need to contact people daily or weekly. Every four to six weeks, he writes, is probably enough. And once you've contacted them, again, the key thing is to invite more voices to communicate as well. We also got a question earlier on about what are the best ways to keep track of where candidates will be appearing and when. 
you can see that this is just a sample um, screenshot highlighted from his event. And what we basically highlight is that CCL reminds volunteers in this month's action sheet, you can find event schedules on candidate websites, on Facebook pages. Today's examples have also highlighted you can strategically leverage local connections to see if there are specific opportunities that you might not see in public venues like the newspaper or radio really being able to kind of be invited into some of these other, um, you know, more focused or exclusive fundraiser events is another wonderful way to have their ear and FaceTime one-on-one -on -one for a while and really highlight your concern as a constituent. And the really uh, important other thing is to share these with your group via an online calendar and really have a distributed plan to know who's gonna attend which so that you can cover full coverage and get to know candidates throughout the district on both sides of the aisle. I'll just close with one last slide here before passing it to you, Representative Shanklin, and that is highlighting uh, Representative Claudine Schneider's thoughts, who's been involved on the national level scene for politics for a long time. And her advice is pretty straightforward. The best thing that she always says is to be visible. Attend the candidates' fundraisers or their town hall meetings, the rallies, whatever it is, say hello and introduce yourself each time. Don't think that they're gonna remember who you are and you know, be friendly, remind them that who you're a part of, Citizens Climate Lobby, and really be straightforward and ask what their plans are to address climate change. Stop there, don't sneak in seven questions, you know, ask them and then have them respond. Don't try to educate them, but be memorable, friendly, and make sure that they know that as a constituent, this is continuing to be a high priority for you and whoever else is attending with you. She also says, find creative ways to get to know candidates, especially on in this primary season. You can volunteer to drive them to an event. You can find other ways to you know, have a one-on-one -on -one outside of the traditional dialogue. Find whatever way you can to get their ear and also consider co-hosting. Uh, you know, the California 39 district did a wonderful job putting it all on together on their own. Maybe there's opportunities she also recommends with the League of Women Voters or other local entities that can co-host an event like what we've talked about together to share that load. So without further ado, I'll pass it to you. I'll still run through the slides, Representative Shanklin, and then we'll have a time for at least another five minutes of Q&A, and I'm happy to stay on the line. I know you probably um, have other places to go others, but if you do have other thoughts that we aren't gonna get to, we'll make sure to go past the hour too, so now that we don't just have 12 minutes. So the floor is yours, and I'll make sure to unmute you if you are still unmuted, perfect. All right, thank you for being here and we're looking forward to learning from your advice as a representative in Wisconsin, Representative Shanklin. Okay, well, thanks so much for the invitation and thank you all for the important work you do. Um, I don't think it can be overstated how pivotal this work is and how sometimes um, it can seem like, you know, there might be a couple setbacks here or there, but that just makes the work that you do so much more important. So. Um, just a little bit about me. I was elected in 2012 to uh, the Wisconsin State Assembly, which is the house in our state legislature. And um, about two weeks before my primary, at a nine-way primary, um, the local chapter of CCL was formed. And I went to the first meeting. There were maybe 20 people there, I think probably 15. And since then, they've grown to an, a tremendous chapter. They've done incredible things in six short years, and I'm so proud of the work that they do and really appreciate CCL. So I want to talk about not only state-level officials, but local officials, because I think that people often underestimate uh, the power of local electeds as well as state-level officials and what they can do to influence their members of Congress. So. I think it's really important, and I know CCL focuses on this a lot by influencing um, uh, members of Congress by writing letters to the editor and having individual citizens work to change um, their minds and to also bring in new members to the caucus. But I also think there are ways that um, CCL members can work in coalition with local and state government leaders to add even more pressure to members of Congress. And even if your member of Congress is doing great things like joining the Climate Caucus and um, opposing resolutions that oppose carbon taxes, for example, maybe they're not the ones introducing legislation or maybe not, they're not the ones co-sponsoring the legislation. And so I think there are always ways to influence your members of Congress to do even more for you. And one way to do that, since you don't get FaceTime with them every day, is by leveraging your local and state government officials to do so. So you can do 
so many things with just a few state legislators and a few mayors and a few county executives. One thing that you can use highly successfully is sign on letters. Um, these are circulated in just about every legislature. They're certainly circulated in Congress to take positions on issues. Um, for example, I just received a letter back from my one of my US senators on a hemp bill that we all asked her to support and she signed on to it. And I, um, one of my colleagues in the legislature circulated this letter and sent it to the whole legislature and said, if anyone wants to sign on, let me know. Um, these are really powerful because when an elected official gets, you know, especially a statewide elected official like a US Senator gets a letter asking for support or to oppose a bill from 20, 30, 40, even 50 people who are also elected officials, they know that they have tremendous influence within that region or within the whole state and they're going to listen and I can promise you you're going to get a super quick reply. Before I got that letter back from my senator today, um, I also got a call personally from her office letting me know that she signed on to that bill. So just so you know, like we as elected officials, uh, we can get even more expedient answers from our elected officials and you can work with us in coalition to do so. Um, another thing that you can do, and we've seen a lot of cities do this successfully with mayors, um, is join, you know, pass re resolutions on the Paris Climate Accord. And so you can do that, but you can also call on Congress from your city, from your village board, from your town. You can say this is such an important issue that our little village of 350 people is going to weigh in. We're going to pass a unanimous resolution, you know, 4-0 vote calling on congressional action on climate issues. Maybe you're even gonna use the CCL bill model to do it, or maybe you'll be less specific and say, this is what it looks like ideally, or we just care about climate, whatever it is, but you can absolutely do that. You can do the same thing in state houses, get one or two um, legislators, maybe opposite parties to introduce a resolution calling on congressional action. Some some states have rules in their legislature about whether or not you can actually call on action for Congress in Wisconsin. It's a little bit dicey. We can't like advocate for specific bills using legislative resolutions, but we can call for action on climate change, for example. Generating press attention, you all know the power of the press. You utilize it extremely well every day. Don't forget that elected officials are highly sensitive, highly sensitive as well to press. And so when you get state level officials and local level officials that are also um, putting letters or columns in the paper, writing press releases, maybe every Earth Day they write a list of people who have helped them work on climate change and maybe they're an incredibly popular politician in their district. Um, every member of Congress has a binder of press that they read every, you know, hopefully every day that their staff assembles and they know who their local and state elected officials are. They know who their mayors are. They know who their county executives are, um, if they're good. And they're going to be highly sensitive to that. So don't forget to ask for those things from people who aren't just members of Congress because your congressional representatives are absolutely watching what st state and local elected officials are doing. It's campaign season right now. I personally am in contact with people on the campaign side of um, congressional races and, you know, our U.S. Senator, uh, highly contested U.S. Senate race here on an almost daily basis. And I am a state legislator. So I... Clearly I can say things like, you know, I can pass along messages and say, this is a really important issue. I flag issues all the time for them. I say, you know, water quality is a highly important issue in my district. Can we work on this together? So there are things that we can do. We can help you influence members of Congress. And don't forget, ask local and state elected officials to generate press attention too. One way to do that, if you're looking for a hook, rallies and petition drives can really help get that press attention. Um, rather than um, just focusing on like very uh, fact-based letters to the editor, maybe somebody does a climate rally where they, instead of having all the volunteers for CCL come in, they bring in a hundred kids who are like holding signs saying, we want a future. You know, maybe you do something creative like that, but, but don't rule those things out. Petition drives too. Let's say you have a member of Congress who's extremely stubborn and unwilling to act on anything, but you can invite your news media, invite your local press, invite your 
um, invite the people who are really driving this issue locally, whether it's mayor, county executive, whatever else, bring them in and have them deliver those petitions alongside of your people, right? That can be incredibly powerful and you'll get great press. Um, another thing that people sometimes forget about is elected officials love to hold listening sessions and round tables. They like to know what's going on in their district and you'll see a lot of this, especially around election time. Um, they'll be hosting round tables on maybe gun violence or the opioid crisis or mental health access or public schools and they'll bring in educators or law enforcement or you know what, whatever issue. I'm personally hosting one soon on water quality so that's just an example of an important issue to my district. Why not do one on climate change and bring in your people, bring in those local elected officials, maybe bring in some farmers and talk about the impact on agriculture in your local economy. Um, maybe tourism is an important piece for you you and climate change will absolutely affect it because it depends on four seasons, for example. Um, whatever the local hook is, do a roundtable session on that. Invite the press, make it open, invite other elected officials, and invite some scientists. And again, one more way to get that outreach in, get good press, maybe even invite some meteorologists who you're trying to reach out to to get good coverage on TV. Whatever it is, that's another way to um, use local and state officials to influence your members of Congress. And, and you can invite them too, especially around election season. They're probably going to want to show up to that unless they're dodging you on the issue. Um, and then local ordinances or state legislation. I tell my CCL people all the time, like, don't discount the state legislature. We can help on certain issues. Um, maybe maybe the, the current makeup of your legislature isn't equipped to have conversations on carbon pricing yet. But maybe instead, you know, you can sign a resolution supporting the Paris Climate Agreement. You can create study committees or work groups on climate change. A lot of legislatures are set up to study issues in a nonpartisan way. Um, and they'll bring in experts and they'll make sure that um, hopefully it's approached in a non-biased way. And so that's another way that you can really do something. I personally applied, I apply every year for one in Wisconsin. I haven't gotten one yet, um, but that's another avenue for you. And then of course, there's always renewable energy investment as renewable energy pricing continues to become more and more economic and affordable. It's easier and easier to leverage. So that's another way to sort of like get an in, um, start with renewable energy with some of your local and state leaders and then get them to climate change and have them influence your members of Congress. Obviously, this strategy is entirely dependent on your local political landscape and your state political landscape, but this is just basic advice on how you can leverage officials to help you get to your members of Congress. So just as my best advice to people who want to influence Congress is to build personal relationships early, uh, build personal relationships not only with staff, but hopefully on the local level, you know who your mayor or county executive or county board chair are and try to have coffee with them if you can get a meeting or ask to meet with their staff. And I tell people all the time, staff are just as important as elected officials meet with them too. I think your goal should be to get on a first name basis with all of your elected officials. We listen um, when we see people who continue to show up. You've heard the advice over and over, show up, show up, show up, show up. It's absolutely true. Um, if you see something in the news or something on someone's Facebook that they did that you really like, make sure to let them know, thank them for it, because you probably know that uh, elected officials don't get thanked as often as they get like negative feedback. So when you see something they do that's really great, thank them. Um, don't always ask for something when you're first meeting, maybe just talk to them about an issue, um, but build that relationship so you're on the first name basis and try to do that with every level of government. Um, some people tell me that's unrealistic and I'll tell them, listen, uh, I know so many activists who are just stubborn and diligent and persistent and they absolutely have created this for themselves so it can be done. Um, so then when you start meeting with them to really influence them, going to the second column of advice, then you need to get a very specific ask. You need to tailor your ask to make sure it's, is it realistic? Can they actually accomplish this for you? You can't ask them to solve the climate change issue by themselves. Like that's just not a realistic ask, but you can ask them to support a bill or to vote against a bill or to co-sponsor a bill or to introduce a bill, right? So make sure the ask is reflective of the needs of the district and your goals. Make sure it's approachable, reasonable, responsible, and achievable, right? Otherwise you're wasting your time and you're wasting their time and you're only gonna be frustrated. So make sure you're being realistic. 
when you talk to them, you get a meeting with them personally, make sure your argument is personal. Um, I tell people all the time, it's so important to have the right information that's you know nonpartisan, unbiased, scientific, but what's your hook? Why are you here? Everybody has a story. Some people care and joined CCL because they want their grandkids to have the same quality of life that they did. Tell me about your grandkid. What is her name? Like, tell me what her favorite activities are. Maybe you just love to watch her um, on Saturdays and you guys go to the farmer's market and then like go to the local river to check things out and like hang out all day. I want to know that stuff. If you have a hook, to the issue. So when I think of my friend Jim, I think of his granddaughter Ruthie, right? Like those types of things, we as legislators get lobbied every day, um, every day of the year on dozens, if not hundreds of issues, depending on the day and what we're looking at for the week, right? So we need to be able to remember things. And one way to do that is by making your argument personal. I've also seen personal narratives change votes. They completely change votes. It's it sometimes people just do not care about an issue until it directly affects them. So maybe you will have a very large agricultural district and scientists are starting to notice climate change patterns affecting their harvest. Could you bring in a, a group of farmers to the Capitol to talk to your state legislator about it. And all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, this is real, it's happening. 20 years from now, we're gonna have all these family farms um, completely dependent on uh, you know, not having worse climate change in the future and they're gonna go out of business, what can I do? Maybe I'll join my state climate caucus or maybe I'm in a position to call my senator who hasn't joined the climate caucus yet in Congress, right? So that's another example. Um, then after you have your personal story, the hook, you know, what's in it for me? Why do I care? That type of thing. Use research to buoy your argument. So that's when you bring in the facts, but just don't start with the cold hard facts is my advice. Um, and apply it to their district and the local economy, especially with members of Congress. Like this can get a little bit more difficult so I think finding, like, build yourself a legion of state legislators, mayors, county executives, county board chairs, people who are university leaders, people who are business leaders, just build yourself a coalition in your congressional district. Don't just focus on your member of Congress. Because if you build that coalition and they're organizing on things like, we can't snowmobile anymore, you know, we've lost our tourism economy because of that, all of a sudden this is personal, right? Climate change is no longer ideological if you've got the economic impact studies, if you've got the farmers or the snowmobile industry people, you've got the foresters, uh, you name it. That's gonna start being personal. And that's my best advice is um, build yourself, your legion of people, not just members of Congress, but locally, your state and local elected officials, and then bring in business leaders and other professionals and have them lobby and get those people to lobby you um, or to lobby the members of Congress. So just a quick reminder that if you're interested in finding out how the intersection of tonight's webinar plays into July's monthly actions for CCL groups throughout the country, the slide deck does have a reminder of the importance of how these resources can be used with local plans, as well as a series of scripts for sample questions if you're interested depending on whether or not your actual plan form is moderated, if it's one where you can ask the question, and then some ideas for questions to ask in forums that are politically mixed, that are largely progressive, and are largely conservative. So I know I've sped through those just because we're at the end of the webinar, but if you're interested, just go to community, look up this webinar, and you can see the language. They're also available for the most part in the monthly action plan. So we'll just close by doing a quick reminder of where to find the lesson. As always, afterwards, it'll be in the recent training tab of the Learning Center. You can find that here, just highlighted on that tab. We also want to make sure to emphasize that if you're interested in going in deeper, we also have another webinar with even more resources on campaign season activities. It's where both uh, the California 39 and CCL Tucson groups got their ideas uh, specifically in the first place. So feel free to go to community and then within the Learning Center's lobbying lessons, look for the campaign season activities resource. As always, if you have any questions, suggestions, or further ideas and want to make sure to get in touch with the speakers, feel free to reach out to me. My email is posted there, brett at citizensclimate.org. And with that, we want to thank everyone for being on tonight's webinar. 
We cannot thank you enough for your leadership on this essential issue in Wisconsin and giving time amidst a busy campaign event to also support our work in advocacy. And uh, we just wish everyone a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your advice. It's great. Yeah, take care. Keep up the good work.